All right, we're dealing with this lesson. The series is called Salt and Light for our guests as well. This is we're dealing with metaphors in the scriptures. Um, today, we started last week with lesson 1A. Today is 1B for me, is what we're doing. So I took this and divided it up. So last week we dealt with the salt. Today we're going to deal with the light. That's what lesson one deals with, salt and light, the first one. And then next time we'll deal with others, you know, different ones, metaphors throughout the scriptures. So God has given us the privilege of representing him. Thinking about that from the author this, who wrote this lesson up. We got, you know, when we, when we got saved, the Lord did what? He left us here. We didn't get saved, you're gone. Not everybody gets saved and you're just out of here. You know, you, he leaves us behind to do what? To be a testimony to somebody else. To be a witness, a testimony. So we have that privilege. You think about it, we have a privilege of representing him. We have that privilege of being a testimony to other people. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 13, if you want to turn there, we'll be in there and in and out of there. Matthew chapter 5 verse, get there. And the Lord said, ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Well, last week we dealt with salt. So, what are the four characteristics of salt that we dealt with last week? Flavor. Flavor. Remember, they all started with a P. Oh. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to get you to think about it in those terms. What were they? Oh, boy, I hear everybody. Even this side is even talking. They're reading their notes now. Yeah, I know what they are now. Uh, preserves. Right? Pleases and prize. So what you know what these characteristics are. So what did you learn about these characteristics as for us as Christians? So for the first one there, preserves. I know y'all looking y'all looking through your notes real quick. To keep. To keep. Remember that? Yes. And we are to do we with our presence, the Lord allows us to be what? We're a testimony. We should be a testimony to the world around us. Should we not? What's the other one about purifies? Salt purifies, doesn't it? It's not pleasant sometimes. Remember, we had the, the simple illustration was if you got a sore throat, what do you do with salt? Put a little salt in hot water, warm water, how hard you want. Hot you want to deal with it, but a little warm water. It's not, not pleasant, but it helps. But even as it preserves uh, food and things like that was used for. Pleases. Man, we talk about salt. And this is where all those different kinds of salt. I didn't know there's all those kinds of salts. But we use it for what? Helping our taste buds. Yeah, we are. We pleases us. But that's the way we should be to the world. We should be a testimony to others. Remember what Paul said about himself? That he was going to be whatever it and I'm a fair, paraphrasing this in a way for you, but whatever I can do to win somebody, that's what I'm going to do. Of course, scripturally right, to do that. He was going to be to all people, be it rich, be poor, whatever, to reach those people. And the last one is prods. What was the prod? What, how does salt prod anything? Makes you thirsty, doesn't it? Make you want to get a drink of water. Remember the illustration we used? A couple of illustrations were used about the salt licks and those kind of things. So if we're salt, how, what, how are we making it? How does that apply to our lives that we're prodding other people if we're the salt? Silent over here. The side got real quiet. Anybody? That's right. 
we should be that testimony so they say, why are you so different? I see that you don't, you deal with, you have situations that happen in your life, but you don't act like other people do. You know, there's something different about you. Why are you so different than everybody else? And you should be that testimony. We, and I say we should be that testimony to other people when they see something about us. Because when tragedy happens in our lives, do we just throw up our hands and just say the world's coming to pieces? Or do we, they see us differently. They see us still got a smile on our face and a joy in our heart. And you know what? We got our eyes focused on, on the Lord. And they should be able to see that differently in our lives. So we should be prodding other people to recognize something different about us. Not because we're, look at me, but look at the Lord who's made me what I am. So light. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. We just read that here. So the three characteristics about light in this lesson we're going to be dealing with, it attracts, it repels, and requires a source. A source. So it attracts, it repels, it requires a source. So attracts. How does light attract? Very simplistically, how does light attract? The brilliance of it. Light doesn't shine. Brilliance of it. Brilliance of You ever been somewhere at night and look at the street lights? In the summertime, of course, better. In wintertime, it's not much happening there. But got a lot of bugs showing up, do you? I remember as a kid, we'd be out at night. I lived in Texas at the time. And we see those bats flying around, just, zip, you know, just zipping around through us at night, you know. And you know what they were doing? They were eating the bugs that were hanging around the lights. That's what they were hunting for. Yeah. So insects, they like the light. And even fishing. Some people go fishing with lights at night. My, my sister-in-law in Florida, they, they do go get shrimp and they put light out there and kind of draws the shrimp around too as well. So it, those things of, of, of light of, of does what? It attracts, does it not? It attracts. So what does it say scripturally about attracting? Let me, let me move this down. What did Jesus say in eight, John 8, 12? Then spake Jesus again unto them saying, what? I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have, light, have the light of life. We did Matthew 5, 16. You know, there's been people throughout, good preachers, and this is one here, John Wesley. He says, I light, let's just say, if I light myself on fire, I light myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. He was one of those guys that, these guys did not have mics to work with and sound systems to work with, but they preached to hundreds of people at one time. There's another one, George Whitfield. Jonathan Edwards. These are some of the old time preachers that preached and they did what? They were, they were affecting people's lives. They were reaching out, winning souls was their purpose. And people would come from all over, come to see and to hear what they'd had to say. These anchorite monks, this over here is the illustration of this guy, Simeon Stylus. Let me ask you something. <coughs> it says, in Matthew 5, 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now these anch anchorites, monks, and that's why I need to read this for you. When they existed, church history tells that this group called the anchorites who lived in the 4th century, they dwelt in solitude, fasted and injured their bodies. The nearer they could bring themselves to the level of the animals, the better pleased they were. One sect of anchorites actually grazed with the common herds in the fields, and they became henceforth, whatever word they used, we call shepherds. They, re they acquired a great reputation for holiness because of their mournful attitude toward life. Is that what we've been called to do? To be like monks? This guy here, this one, this guy up here, I got it for you. One of the most famous of these monks was Simeon, so-called from standing for years on top of a column 60 feet high until his muscles became rigid. Some of the hermits hung weights on their bodies. Others kept themselves in cages. All endured to make themselves holy through being miserable. Is that what we've been called to do? 
to solitude as a, you know, you see these monasteries, you know, the old monasteries they had built on these mountains, out in these foreign areas somewhere, remote areas they were built, and they, that's where they wanted to stay, and they didn't talk to each other, or whatever it was. That's not what we've been called to do. We're not to be like monks and, and secluding ourselves from the world, because the Lord said what? We're to be what? Let your light so shine in your own space. No, that ain't what he said. Let your light so shine before men. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. It's, it's sometimes you just feel like you just, I don't want to deal with anybody. Don't you? We all have that tendency to don't want to deal with other people right now. But it shouldn't be like that all the time in our life. But we should be that testimony that we are shining before men at all. Whenever we come in contact with others, to be a shining light to them. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So are we to live as monks secluded from others? The Lord said, I have given them thy word, and thy word have, the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the, the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Yeah, we live in a world that's not pleasant sometimes. It's evil and there's all that going on around us. But we're still to do what? The Lord wants us to do what? To be a shining light, a testimony to other people. I don't know if you noticed there when we read Matthew, back in Matthew chapter 5 and verse, let's go to 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. The purpose of the candle, the purpose of the light is to do what? Reveal, Reveal illuminate. Expose. I'm sorry? Expose. Expose, okay. But also, do you do notice there in the last part of that verse, it says, unto all that are in the house. It's not just for me. The light is not just for me. It's for all that are around to help them. And that's what we should be doing. We should be a light that's helping all that's around us. People that we deal with, we meet. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14. You may, you, I think you have these in your handouts, but we'll go there. Philippians chapter 2 verse 14 says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and, of, and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the, the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, and that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. First John 2, 15, verse 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. I know we get familiar with eyes. We're so familiar with these verses at times. But what did you see in there? Kind of reiterating what I just said earlier. We're not to be like monks. Secluding ourselves away from other people. Yes, the world's not great sometimes. It's bad. It's evil around us. We deal with situations all the time. We deal with filthiness and whatever garbage around us all the time. But how are we to live? We're to be that testimony. We're to be What? In Philippians, he says, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the, world, in the midst of the crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. We know these things, and that's the way we should be, a shining light in the world. The Lord said about John the Baptist, he was a burning and a shining light. And with that, what did John the Baptist do? As a burning and a shining light. As he is, as he was at that time. What was, with that characteristics about him, what, what happened? Okay, he's a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, okay. But what else? I ask questions. I know I ask a lot of questions. You don't have a cup of coffee in your hand, and it's hard to think sometimes. I understand. And I probably don't ask them the right way. But what did you know about John the Baptist? When he spoke... Crowds showed up, didn't they? People came to hear this guy who was a little different than them. Sure, he ate things differently, he dressed a little differently, but he preached something they'd never heard before about the coming of the Lord. 
And he got their attention. He was that shining light. He was that testimony to other people. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, we've read that. Matthew, John chapter 3 and verse 21. <clears throat> but he that doeth, doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest to all that are wrought in God. So we talked about light, what? Attracts. But also light does what else? Repels. Now how can light repel? How can light repel? Well, I don't know if this is repelling or warning, but like a lighthouse keeps ships from coming in. Good point. Good point. <laughs> Tells them stay away from, they know where to, not to go to, which coast, stay away from the coast, don't they? Yeah. Anybody else? Repels the darkness. <laughs> All them lights start coming on. Click, click. <laughs> Keeps the bad people away, doesn't it? Have you ever been into a cave or a cavern in a dark place like that? And it has no light in it. You carry a light in there with you, don't you? Have you been? I've been in this uh, marble cave in Missouri a long time ago. We went there. <clears throat> it's in Silver Dollar City up in Missouri there, this cavern there. They say inside this area here, two hot, I think it was two hot air balloons could fit inside there at one time. It's so big. There's a set of steps coming down. You come in from here, there's a set of steps, and you work your way down, work your way down, to get down here. But as we did the tour through that, we got to a certain section, and she turned the lights out. You ever been in the dark? I mean, really in the dark. There's no light. It's not like you pull out your cell phone, and we didn't have these kind of cell phones back then. It's been a long time ago. Like you pull out your light. No. You know, you put your hand right here. You couldn't see a thing. You're totally in darkness. Mm. Wow. Right. It is dark. I mean, I worked on, I worked on ships and on the, the shipyard. And when the lights have gone out sometimes, they, had, they issue us a light stick. You had to have a light stick or a flashlight and a light stick. And that little tiny glowing light, whew, you felt a little safer, I sense. You felt, at least I got something here to sit, at least sit down with or somewhere. I can't move around. But when you're in the pitch black dark and there's nothing there, and you know, all you can do is you need that light, don't you? No matter how small that light might be, you need a light there to repel the darkness. Just a little bit of light can make you feel a little bit more comfortable, doesn't it? And even if you're in a situation like wherever you're at, like that you see, I know there's civilization there or something. There's a light there, you know. Lamp lighters back in England, they used to have these guys going around lighting the lamps at night on the streets to repel the darkness at night on the streets. John 3.19 says, and this is a condemnation that light is come into the world and men loved what? Darkness. Because, rather than light, because their deeds were evil. The author points out, and you probably, hopefully you've never experienced it, you may have, I don't know, but at least you've seen it probably. You've seen, seen on TV or something like that. But you see where these bars, and you go down the street and these places where they got bars and taverns and all that, a lot of times they're dark, aren't they? Those clubs and things will be dark inside them. And that's what he points out. Men love darkness rather than light. Because of why? Rather than light, because their deeds were evil. They don't want the light on. So light repels. <clears throat> now, this is a short lesson for you, so you'd be done early today. So you're already thinking, I want point number three in less than, you know, 20 minutes. Requires a source. So where is light? For us, where does our light come from? 
from the Lord. Right. And John, and, uh, God himself is our source of light. Okay, so where does the light come from? God himself. James 1, chapter 17. James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. <clears throat> you know, I looked this up and I was trying, I was thinking on this verse here when I was looking at Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Think in the natural world, what kind of lights are out there? Hmm? Sunshine, sunshine, yeah. The sun, and then you got the moon, but the moon doesn't have its own light, does it? It reflects the light. And then you got stars up there. But God is the, is the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness or neither shadow of turning. You know, we look at the, you know, sometimes we have what, when the solar, was a solar eclipse where it gets blocked out? The sun is still there and gets blocked out. You can't see it. But you know, God is always there. Nothing blocks him out. Nothing hides him, I guess you want to say. Nothing can stop the Lord. When we walk with God, we have all the light we need. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. The whom of, of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 36, verse 9. For thee, for with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The Lord is the source of our light. And we belong to him. And we should be what? We should be reflecting that light. We should be shining and being a testimony for him. When, when Paul, he used to be Saul, became Paul on the roads of Damascus, he said, at midday, O king, I saw in the light, in the way, a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and then which journeyed with me. The Lord's light is brighter than the sun's light. I mean, we know this. It's very simple. But he's pointing out the brightness of the Lord. And brighter than the sun. You think about it. We look go outside, and, okay, the sun's pretty bright. I got to wear sunglasses. I can't even look at the sun. It's so bright. But can you imagine Paul, well, Saul at the time became Paul, but out there and he sees this light that's brighter than the sun out there. Back to this moon. We must live in such a way that God is so real and personal to us that others will see in his, his light reflected from our lives, even as the moon reflects the light of the sun. And when you see this, the moon, it's in phases and you know, wanes and waxes and all. It goes through its different phases. But it's still doing what? It's reflecting the sun. Different. The, the moon has no light of its own to work with. So where's another source of light for us? Artificial. Okay, well not artificial. I'm talking about scripturally. That was a hint. Where's another source of light for us? That's right. That's right. God's word is a light for us, isn't it not? He allows us to have his word. Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. In 2 Peter 1, 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. God left his word for us to help us. To help us to learn from him and to help us in our lives how to live each day. Uh, I don't remember what, one, sometime during the week, Pastor, not Pastor, Dr. Comfort preached on about the Word of God. That having, needing to use, to be into the Word of God. To be into it. And I think I mentioned it last Sunday. We need to be into the Word of God how often? Daily. Every day we need to be reading God's Word. 
to apply it to our lives, to help us, to cleanse us, and to find out, you know, to, to help us to search our hearts is what we need to be using God's word. Peter said, you know, like he said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, where until you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. About 1450 AD, Johannes Gutenberg built the first printing press. Now this is, this is a modern day guy standing here, of course, it's not him. This is not the official record of this guy doing the printing press, but it shows you what the printing press looked like. Can you imagine printing like that when they put the little type set inside that thing and then they have to do all the little things they got to do to make one page at a time. The thing is, is when the printing press came out, what did it do for the world? They, they made the Bible available. Because how was the Bible being available earlier? Writing it down. Everything had to be written down exactly. Very tedious process. And how many of those could you write down? How many of those could you make by hand and to hand it to somebody else? You just didn't hand them to anybody else. There wasn't, there wasn't, you couldn't do them fast. There's no way. And it, it, there was a lot of suppression, of course, of those trying to get the Bible out. But when he designed the printing press, the first book, the first book on the that came off a printing press. Not just a pamphlet or a sheet or whatever. The first book was the Bible that came off the printing press. The Gutenberg Bible was the first book printed on the printing press about 1453. But imagine before that having to do it by hand. And how, this, how there was those who were trying to suppress. Satan was trying everything he could to suppress the Bible from getting out into people's hands. Why? Why would he suppress the Bible? Why would he suppress a book? Huh? He knew its power. And what would happen when you start reading the word of God, it will change your life and it will change people's lives and get them out of the darkness. And he knew that. I mean, well, he knows that, whatever. But to do that. But here the printing press was a, making the Bible being printed. And then they could start printing more and printing more copies of it. I got a note here I had got from somewhere else another. Where's that right here about the Bible? On permanent display, and this is in the Library of Congress, in, per, per, in permanent display are two Latin Bibles. The Bible was the first book that was printed on a printing press and is the most popular and widely distributed book in human history. One of the Bibles on display at the Library of Congress is the Gutenberg Bible, which you I reference here, the first Bible print of the 21 complete surviving copies, England and America own 12 of those. The other Bible on display is the great Bible of men's. It was handwritten and dates to the same year. Thus it was completed at the same time that the Gutenberg was printing his Bible and is one of the last handwritten Bibles. The, the Great Bible and the Gutenberg Bible were not only produced at the same time, but also in the same town in Germany. The Men's Bible, known as the Great Bible, represents the countless Bibles that were ob laboriously handwritten for a millennium and a half from the time of the apostles until the invention of the printing press. The impact of the printing press was that it allowed the Bible to be what? Be printed and to be distributed. And it just grew from there. Because that Bible is what helps us to have light in our life and sheds light in our life. Because he said, where is it? we just said that in Psalm. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The entrance of thy word giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. And you know the scriptures are written to help the simple. So the number of languages the Bible has, has been translated in. The full Bible in 698, the New Testament about 1548, and portions of the Bible at 1138, about 1200, close. At least some portion, about 3,385 languages. You think, well, that's pretty well. The world's covered then, right? We got it covered. So how many languages are in the world? I know you're all on your phone. Get the answer. I had to look this up. How many languages in the world? 6,500 spoken languages. 
on a sidetrack, we went to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C. Have you ever, anybody been there? All right, I see two hands went up. Very impressive place to go see. You get a chance, go see it. I think it's six stories tall, whatever. They have the, one room is just about the history of the Bible. I mean, it just goes from, you, you spend all day almost just going through the whole thing in there. It's just amazing. But the things that they were showing in there about the Bible, from, from history and on through, it's just amazing to see it. And they talk about the languages that it's been you know, translated into. And they have an illustration of that, like a library that you walk in. It looks like a library, but there are books, and each color represents which language it had been translated, which portion of this language had been translated in. It's really daunting to look at. There's a lot of languages that just don't have the Bible. You know. So the key aspect of both salt and light is that they make a difference in their surroundings. Do they not? Salt makes a difference. Light makes a difference. And that's why the Lord used that. You're what? What did he say back in Matthew again? Matthew says, Ye are the salt of the earth. No, you're just the salt of your little neighborhood and your little tiny world. No, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? Is it thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Isn't it amazing how he just uses the simplest things to explain to us in the scriptures about how we are? That we are, this, we are the salt and we are the light, to be in that testimony. The other point of his statement was, up here was, when our lives fulfill the basic functions of salt and light, we too will make a difference in the lives of others for the cause of Christ. And I think it's a very true statement. If we fulfill and, and, and allow the word of God to apply in our lives, to work in our lives, we can make a difference to somebody else. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Are we just supposed to be, I got my own little, my, my little light, and I'm just going to be salty for myself and not share with anybody else? We're to be a salt, a light, and a testimony to other people.